Welcome to the World Health Organization workshop, The Skillful Communicator. The focus of this program will be on being clear and understanding others. For this program, you will need to set aside at least 30 minutes of uninterrupted time. You'll also need the learning package, specifically the notes page for this module, and a pen, pencil, or something else to write with. The goals for this Skillful Communicator program are as follows. Recognize when and how to use three components of communication, specifically speaking, questioning, and listening. Also, prevent misunderstanding by clarifying what others truly mean, both spoken and inferred. And then also, when it comes to looking at problems, defining the various layers of a problem. What are your specific goals for this workshop? When you think about how you communicate with others, which do you do more of? Speak, listen, or question? If you met with your manager before this program began, what, if anything, did your manager mention to you about your communication skills? Let's take a look at the communication cycle. Here is the diagram that we use to illustrate the communication cycle. What do you notice about the communication cycle model? For me, the first thing that I noticed was that it was a circle. And what that would imply is there's no beginning and end. It's a continuous process. The second thing that I noticed is that there were three equal pieces, represented by speak, question, and listen. What I have found from personal experience is that if I use the communication cycle in a way that balances how much I speak, how much I ask questions, and how much I listen, I find that I gain more information about the other person's point of view. And as a leader, it's very helpful in making sure that I'm informed about the decisions that I have to make. Let's look at an example of the communication cycle. In this next demonstration, you will see a leader listening to her direct report. Watch for what did you see the leader do? What did you hear the leader say? What was the reaction of the other person? Make some notes as you watch. Hi Elizabeth, it looks like you have something on your mind. Well actually I do. I have a small problem with the project. But don't worry, everything's on track. We've got everybody completed their assignments, and even though we've got people from various regions on our conference calls, I think we're doing okay. However, I've got a problem with Ian. He just wants to take control. I, I don't know. Uh, in the meetings, it seems like he wants to take charge. Do you think he wants to take charge? over you. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not sure exactly what happens, but it's just that Ian, every single project, I seem to spend two to three times every meeting wrestling back control. And I know that Ian, he has a lot of experience, but my major concern is that others on the project may not give the same level of effort. It's as if they, I think, sometimes think that, well, Ian will do it, or if I do do it, the next time we meet with Ian again, he'll change it. So you think others will not be as motivated or would not contribute as much because Ian is taking over? Yes, and the other thing is, I'm not so sure he has the best interests in mind. Ian will sometimes also go where he believes the funding is. He'll put his energy in that direction. And this is not always in the best interest of the program. So you think that his input may not be in the best direction to meet the goals? That's it, exactly. And in the end, I'm also very concerned because I'm, I want to make sure that I maintain credibility with the council. That's very important to me. Are you looking for any ideas or suggestions? No. I think I've got this one under control. I guess I really just wanted to come in here and vent. 
for now. Sounds great. Sounds like you have some ideas of how you like to take this with Ian. Why don't I suggest we get together after your next meeting, see how things are going, and if we need to discuss it any further, we can do so at that time. That sounds like a good idea. Thanks, Sandra. I appreciate it. Did you notice two main things in that demonstration? The first is that when she was listening, the leader confirmed understanding with a statement rather than a question. The second is that the leader showed interest through her tone of voice and body language. Let's look at these in more detail now. Let's take a closer look at the communication cycle. I'd like to start with the listening component, basically because that's one area that most people tend to need support and help in. A lot of people think listening is simply hearing the other person speak. Other people use listening as a way to simply wait until they have an opportunity to talk. In the communication cycle, we define listening as a set of skills for demonstrating that you understand the thoughts, feelings, and the overall point of view of the speaker. The definition that we have for listening creates a much more involved and interactive process, and what I have found is that it leads to a deeper level of understanding of the other person's situation. I also walk away from the situation having a better idea of what are my options and what can I do to be more supportive of the individual. When I think about listening, what are some of the benefits that exist for myself, for the direct reports, or for other people? When we look at benefits of listening, it helps us in a number of ways. Improved clarity. It's also a way of demonstrating respect for the other individual. It's a way of empowering your direct reports to take action. It allows you to get more information, a full picture, and it helps the speaker stay on track and be focused. If you remember our definition of listening, one of the first things we said is that listening is a set of skills. So specifically, what are those skills? There's the skill of attending, following, and reflecting, as well as silence. If we take a closer look at what we mean by attending, in essence, it's the body language of listening. It's what other people see when you're engaged in listening. That would involve direct eye contact. People have a tendency to lean forward. Get a little bit closer to the person who's speaking. Their arms and hands tend to be at their side or in their lap, not folded, crossed. They tend to nod their head when they're listening. There's generally a positive expression on their face. They're smiling, provided that's appropriate to what they're hearing. And overall, there's a relaxed facial expression that most people demonstrate. Another skill that people use when they're using the communication cycle is following. And specifically what we mean by following is these are the verbal uh, indications that you understand what the person's saying. Many times they're words or sometimes sounds. You would understand what I mean if you listen to people when they're on the phone. They say such things as, mm-hmm, sure, oh, great, really, I understand. And what these following or reinforcing words or sounds do is their invitation for the speaker to continue. The next skill I'd like to focus on is reflective listening. And what we mean by reflective listening is that you briefly state in your own words the speaker's thoughts and feelings without evaluation or judgment. So it's much more involved. You take much more of an active role in the listening process than most people would expect. There are some simple guidelines to keep in mind when you're using reflective listening. The first one is to keep it short. Be precise, concise, to the point in making your reflection or your summary. The second thing is keep it in your own words. You don't want to repeat exactly what the other person says. It sounds like a parrot. The third thing is look for the essence. 
Many times it's not the words that people use, but it's the tone of voice or body language. So what's the point? What's the underlying message that people are communicating when they speak? The fourth thing is you want to use it sparingly. If you use it too much, it starts to sound like a technique. So my suggestion is that you integrate reflective listening into your own personal communication style. Now, when do you reflect what per people say? What I do is I look for a pause. They come to the end of a sentence. They take a breath. That's when I will jump in and use a reflection. The other thing is when you reflect, you want to use the pronoun you, you are, or your. And the purpose behind that is to keep the focus on the other person. If you start to hear the words I, mean, and mine in your reflections, you're focusing on yourself and your perspective. And the last thing to keep in mind is you want your reflections to be phrased as a statement. You tell the person what you understand. If you phrase it as a question, it brings in the sense of judgment or evaluation. It may actually interfere or derail the speaker's point of view. There are certain sentence stems or starters that you can use in your reflection, such as you seem, you are. It's as if, it seems as though, you're feeling, you're thinking, it's like. And what you'll find is that by using these sentence stems, you'll always be in the point of view of the speaker. Now that we've reviewed the reflecting guidelines, let's practice using them. I have two situations that I would like you to imagine that someone at work comes up to you and makes a statement. What I'd like you to do is use the reflecting guidelines that we just reviewed to come up with a reflection or summary that captures the essence of what that person's saying. So you're going to need your learning guide and your pen for each one of these situations. So here's the first situation. A colleague comes up to you and they say, you know, I've been preparing research for a country health information system for over a year, and now you want me to drop it just because someone else can't give their input in time. What in the world have they been doing all this time? Stop the program and write your reflection. Let's compare your reflection to some of the possible reflections other people have come up with. Each one of these, you'll notice, is different, but all three of them actually capture the essence of what the person may have been experiencing. The first one was, you're frustrated with this change, or you didn't see that coming at all. Or the third one is, it's as if all your work doesn't matter. Now, what you're looking for after you make this reflection is some kind of acknowledgement or reaction from the person who actually said it. They will be the judge in terms of how accurate your reflection actually was. Let's try one more. In this situation, another colleague comes up to you and they say, I can't believe it. I've been pushing on the need to fill this post as soon as possible. You know, I never thought it would move forward at all, let alone this quickly. Today, I received notification letting me know the post was approved. Stop the program, write your reflection. So how did you do on the second one? When you compare your reflection to these, are they close? Let's take a look. A possible reflection could have been, you didn't see that one coming, or you're excited about this happening, or it came as a nice surprise. Again, the expert or the person who would know exactly what was being communicated would have been the speaker. The key here is don't worry about being exact. Just tell the person what you understood and let them confirm or expand on what they really meant. What I'd like to do is give you an opportunity to see and hear some reflections being put to, to practice. In this next video, I'd like you to watch for three things. First of all, what did you see the leader do? Second, what did you hear the leader say? And third, what was the reaction of the other person? 
Are you looking for any ideas or suggestions? Well, I think I know how to best handle it, but I was just thinking, since Ian used to be one of your staff members, perhaps you could shed some light on this situation. It seems as though Ian takes over and perhaps even at times oversteps his authority. That seems to be the problem, and you think that others may not participate or contribute as much as they could because he does take that position. Yeah, that's it exactly. And your goal is to use Ian's expertise without necessarily having him take over. Yeah, that's correct. Well, before I jump in, you said that you had some ideas and thoughts of your own. What have you tried already? Well, I've been thinking, you know, I have a suspicion that some of the other uh, committee members are really looking to me to take the lead on this. So at the end of the meeting, I sometimes think maybe I should have said this or maybe at the beginning of the next meeting I could have a chat with Ian and suggest him giving the other members an opportunity to speak. Deal with it directly? Yeah, but then I don't want the issue to become any bigger than it is. You know, I've actually thought about getting the committee into subcommittees, but that would take a lot of time, and I just don't know which direction to go right now. So it sounds like you have some options, but none the best solution at this time. What would happen if you ask Ian to hold back at the meetings and let the quieter ones contribute first? That could work, but you know, I know I, I want to keep it simple and casual, but I think that could work. Don't want to escalate. Then again, I think it already is escalating. And Jules mentioned in passing the other day something that really gave me the impression he's frustrated as well. So it seems as though you aren't the only one frustrated with Ian's uh, suggestions and ideas. I know Ian. He's a pretty reasonable person. I think you could also be very direct with him mm -hmm. and there won't be a lot of drama around it. Have you thought of asking Ian's help before the meeting? Asking if he could just hold back on his ideas until some of the quieter ones have an opportunity to share their input and information and see how that works. I think that's the way to go on this. That way I'm not letting it get out of control and I'm being preventive, proactive. Yeah, I think that's the way to go. It sounds as though you have a direction to take at this point. Is there anything else? No, I think that's it. I really appreciate your time. Thanks again, Sandra. Well, thanks for letting me know. Why don't we check in after your next meeting, see how things are going, and if we need to talk about it again, we can do so at that time. As you watch the video and the leader using the problem-solving approach, what you may have noticed is that there was a lot of time spent in the listening mode. So if you look at the problem-solving process, what you'll see is that there are four specific steps that you take people through. The first step is to explore. And the goal here is to provide enough opportunity for the other person to explain in detail what the situation is that they are struggling with. Now the purpose behind this is not only to get clarity for yourself as to what the person needs to address, but it also allows the individual to clarify and identify specifically what they are challenged with. You'll notice that there was quite a bit of reflective listening used by the leader at that point. And some of the things you may have heard is the leader using the phrase, you think or you feel. The second part of the problem solving process is once the leader identifies or has a good idea of what the problem is, they will define that problem. They'll identify it. So you may have heard the leader say, for you the problem is, and your goal is to in terms of what they would like to accomplish. Now, the reason this is an important step is you want to make sure that you understand exactly what that person is challenged with. 
Now, I would recommend that after you identify the problem and restate the goal as to what the person would like as a final result, is you pause. What that does is that allows the person to um, confirm, acknowledge that that's accurate, or in some cases they may go on to elaborate in some additional detail as to what that situation is. Now, once you have this confirmation about the problem, then we move into the resolution stage. However, before you jump into offering a solution, what you would do that would be more helpful is to ask the person, what have you tried, what have you done before? And the reason for that is multiple uh, fold. One is so that you don't recommend something that the person has already tried and it didn't work. But also what it builds is responsibility and accountability on the individual who's bringing you the problem to take some actions before they come to you. So even though you may be assisting and supporting them in defining a solution for the problem, they maintain the ownership of that problem. Now, once you find out what they've tried, what they've done, then if you have some input, this is where you would actually bring that up. So I like to position the input as what I have tried in the past has been. And so I put out a solution that I may have worked with that may be appropriate for this situation. And I'm not so much concerned with an exact fit, but I want the person to listen to those pieces of information and incorporate into their solution what they think would be possible for them to do. Once you've identified what the solution is for this situation, then you would schedule some kind of follow-up action, basically whatever would be appropriate in terms of checking in with the person or having them report back to you in terms of how successful they have been in addressing that particular situation. So that pretty much wraps up this segment of um, the workshop. And what I'd like to do is summarize with some of the key takeaways. So the key takeaways for this program have been to balance your speaking, listening, and questioning. And we put that in terms of the communication cycle. Also, we focused on using reflective listening as a way to confirm your understanding and to involve the other person in the conversation and to use the communication cycle as a way to help others solve problems.